War has always seemed to play a major role in uh, defining our times uh, and affected your work as well. You went to Korea? Yes, I joined the Army. Uh, like old uh, Mrs. Stringfellow said, if you could, some people learn things the hard way, but the, at least then you never forget it. Um, I joined the Army and then uh, got pipelined for Korea. I was there after Panmunjom, you know, after the treaty, right after the, uh, the treaty, the, the, the truce. Life amid the ruins, I mean, it was absolute life amid the ruins. Children crying, that's the, the memory of Korea. Um, devastation. The de I saw an elegant um, and ancient cultures in a small Asian country devastated by the impact of cultural and economic imperialism. And the impact of an army of young men given unlimited license for excess of every kind, of violence, sexual, booze, what have you, drugs, a, a blueprint for self-destruction. And I knew that if I endured that, I, w I would perish, I would simply perish. Um, it was there in Korea, in that situation, around those kinds of experiences, and, and I, was up on, um, I was up on the Imjin River and I wanted to swim in it. Um, because I wanted to wash all that that away, all, all that all that away, and I was told I couldn't swim in the Imjin. And um, it was the young Korean there, Yun Sukhan, who explained to me why I couldn't. He said, uh, "When we marry, we move into our uh, grandparents, in with our grandparents, and but the place is devastated. There's nothing growing. It's all dead. So when the first child comes, somebody has to leave, and it's the old man." The grandfather will leave and go sit on the bank of the Indian with a jug of water and a blanket until he dies and will roll down into the water. He said, you can't swim in the Indian because those are our elders being carried out to sea. Well, that's when I cracked, you know, that's when I broke up. I said, I can't do this anymore. You know, this is all wrong. It all has to change and the change has to begin with me. Right then that I decided that the idea of manhood that I had been given, that blueprint for self-destruction, that my father had lied to me about manhood, my drill instructors, my army sergeants, my scoutmaster, my gym instructor in high school, they'd all lied to me about what manhood was, and it was up to me to begin to figure out what it really meant. How did you do it? Painfully. <laughs> Painfully. It takes a long time to shut up and listen. You know, it takes a long time just to plain shut up and listen. Um, I, I tell you, what I, what I, what I learned was. I decided that. The 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 great struggles, the wars that you're talking about, it could be the Bosnian War, it could be the Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, it could be the Korean War, it could be uh, the Iraqi War, whatever. It 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 doesn't matter. It's all every the thing they all have in common is that it's young men with guns doing it to everybody else. Women aren't doing it. Kids aren't doing it. Old people aren't doing it. Disabled people aren't doing it. It's young people with guns. You know they're doing it to everybody else. And we don't have a, a problem with violence in the world. We've got a serious male problem, and and I bought into it. So I know, and I'm buying myself out of it. You see, uh, that's terribly, terribly important for me to for people to understand that and, and begin to shut up and listen. Um, uh, uh, l l the, most, the most important movement in the world is the feminist movement. If we can really figure out what's going on between men and women, the other problems will take care of themselves. I'm sure of it. We're talking to Utah Phillips. We're broadcasting on Democracy Now! and uh, doing it at Free Radio Santa Cruz, which is also broadcasting us live, known as Freak Radio. And uh, Utah Phillips is going to be performing tonight uh, before, well, many hundreds of people. And uh, he's been in places with a couple of people. He's been singing alone or he's been singing before thousands. Um, actually just came off of a concert tour with Ani DeFranco? Oh, no, no. I, I don't tour anymore because of this congestive heart failure. I only leave town about once a month, uh, if that. Um, Ani and I will share the stage, you know, and we happen to be in the same area. She'll invite me to go and do that. I should mention that tonight, I'm not doing this show by myself. Um, I'm, it's called a circle of friends. It's like a living room where some good friends of mine, uh, Bodie Busick, 
great guitarist and a, and a fine song maker and Paul Cam and Eleanor McDonald, who are up from Nevada County, the town I live in. We're going to sit on a stage and share songs and stories together, and uh, that's the way that I want it to be. Well, I wanted to continue on this idea of uh, confronting violence and how you became a pacifist. When did you? How long were you in Korea? I was there for 18 months, and I extended for for some months. Um, I can tell you exactly how. Um, I made it back to Salt Lake, and um, I was going into the post office, and there was an old man sitting under the bush out there, and they're taking a water break. Well, that man was Ammon Hennessy, the great Catholic worker, one of the Dorothy Day's people. And Ammon Hennessy had come to Salt Lake to open the Joe Hill House of Hospitality, one of the Catholic worker houses. And Ammon took me in. Uh, and I, I was there with, with Ammon for about eight years uh, in, at the Joe Hill House. Ammon came to me one day and said, you've got to be a pacifist. And I said, how's that? He said, well, you act out a lot. It's a lot of violent behavior. And I was, you know, I was very angry, very angry person. And um, you just act out a lot. And uh, you, you brawl a lot. You're not any good at it. You're the one that keeps getting thrown through the front door, and I'm tired of fixing the damn thing. You've got to be a pacifist. Um, he had a more fundamentalist way of looking at it. Uh, and I said, what's that? He said, well, I could give you a book by Gandhi, but you wouldn't read it. So he, but he said, you've got to look at, at, um, at nonviolence like um, your capacity for violence like an alcoholic looks at booze. Alcohol, booze will kill an alcoholic. Unless he has the courage to sit in a circle of people that are like that, put his hand up and say, hi, my name's Utah, I'm an alcoholic. But then you can, you, once you own the behavior, you can deal with it, you know, you can have it defined for you by the, the uh, people whose lives you've messed with. And it's not going to go away. Twenty years sober, you're, you're not going to sit in that circle and say, well, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. You're going to put up your hand and say, my name's Utah, I'm an alcoholic. He said it's the same with violence. You acknowledge your capacity for violence you see, and you learn how to deal with it every day, every instant, in every situation for the rest of your life, because it's not going to go away, but it'll save your life, see. It's a different way of looking at pacifism. I have to be a pacifist, you see. So I said, okay, I'll do that, Ammon, and he said, it's not enough, and I said, oh. He said, you were born a white man in mid-20th century industrial America. You came into the world armed to the teeth with an arsenal of weapons, the weapons of privilege, economic privilege, racial privilege, sexual privilege. You're going to be a pacifist. You're not just going to lay down guns and fists and knives and hard, angry words. You're going to have to lay down the weapons of privilege and go into the world completely disarmed. Well, you try that. I've, I've been at it. Ammon died over 30 years ago, and I'm still at it. But if there's one struggle that animates my life, it's probably that one.